Welcome to the Real Estate Raw Show, hosted by Joe Mendoza. Hi guys, Joe Mendoza. Welcome to my show here in sunny San Diego. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into some underwriting. I'm super, super excited to have Robert Beardsley on the show. Robert oversees acquisitions and capital markets for the firm that has acquired over $100 million in assets. He also has written a book called The Definitive Guide to Underwriting Multifamily Acquisitions you can find on Amazon. He's been on other podcast shows. He knows his numbers. He knows underwriting. So get ready. Pay attention. Write a lot of things down. Welcome to the show, Robert Beardsley. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you for being here. So let's get into it a little bit. What were you doing before real estate? Before real estate, there really was no before real estate because I, I grew up in a real estate family, was around real estate my whole life. Uh, both my parents worked from home. So I just constantly overheard them talking business, on the phone with clients, um, you know, handling transactions, just really diving into so much. And I absorbed much more than I really knew because it was kind of just in my subconscious. But I, uh, I ended up going to, I grew up in Silicon Valley, so I was immersed in this technology culture. And so I ended up going to school for computer science. But while in school, I actually circled back to real estate because I was always passionate about investing, looking for the best way to invest, you know, whether it's stocks or is it cryptocurrency or is it real estate? And obviously it's real estate. And uh, so circled back to it and, uh, you know, really started uh, getting heavily involved in the business while still in school and which eventually led to my meeting my now business partner and founding of Lone Star Capital. Perfect. Now, were you investing already in real estate or were you just kind of doing the analytic side of real estate? What were you doing while you were in college? Re the, you know, the main focus was learning, networking and preparing. And I was fortunate enough to be able to do some investing uh, with my family uh, to build some experience prior to actually, uh, you know, leaving school and starting my own company. Perfect. Now, were they in the single family or multifamily as a family? So, you know, our background is in single family. Uh, my dad started a residential brokerage firm in California and was doing everything on the single family side from uh, development, fix and flip, uh, sales. And uh, it was really my intellectual curiosity uh, and research that led us down the multifamily path. And then I, I, you know, I knew my parents were working really hard, you know, making money, but, but still working really hard. And, and I wanted to see something different for them. I wanted to see something better for them. And I really felt compelled that multifamily was a far superior vehicle to achieve what their true goals were, which was to slow down, to, to exit such a transactional business and, and really build true wealth. And so, um, so that's the, you know, so that's how we got started in multifamily as a family. Now, I'm glad you brought that up, Rob. Now, there's folks that get into this game and think, hey, they see something on HDTV, fix and flip this home. Now, you said your parents even did that. What's the biggest difference between fixing and flipping? I know it's probably pretty obvious, but not for the audience. Fixing and flipping versus truly creating some wealth. Well, and you said, you know, that it's probably obvious and it absolutely is. The biggest thing is scale, right? And then number two is you're building something more than just a one-time uh, capital event, right? So when you're doing a fix and flip, your returns are 100% reliant upon your exit strategy. And all this effort goes into that one, hopefully nice pop of appreciation that happens when you sell the property. Uh, in multifamily, yes, appreciation is very important. And yes, you know, mon making the most of your sale is, is important, but we don't live off of that, right? We live off cash flow, or at least that's the right way to invest is to uh, be heavily focused on cash flow and to look at that as the dependable income stream that allows you to more uh, confidently evaluate uh, the, the value of a property as well as keep you in the game longer so that if the market has an up or a down, you can still own the asset and you can ride it out, ride out any bad period of market conditions to end up selling for a profit. So, so those are the two biggest things, cash flow and scale. Thank you. Great, great, great. So let's walk the listeners through 
from acquisition to soliciting investors, holding and disposition, kind of the underwriting involved there. So on acquisition, what's kind of typical um, standard operating procedures when you do some market research, what's your underwriting there? Yeah, so uh, uh, underwriting takes place from the very beginning, right? When a, when a deal first hits your inbox or comes across your desk, uh, really the first thing to do is to qualify it and understand, is this an opportunity that I'm even open to and is it worth my time to underwrite, right? And once you've determined that it is, then we go through our typical underwriting process, which looks like gathering market data, which, you know, you can do so through Googling. You can have paid services like Yardi, CoStar, Reese, and, uh, you know, we need to understand critical components about the location and the property, such as, the uh, median household income in the area. We want to know things like job growth trends, unemployment. And then for the property specifically, we can use the historical financials to understand how is the property performing? And most importantly, how is it performing relative to the market, relative to the opportunity? Because where you make your money is not buying something as is, it's buying something with a vision to make it better. And so that's really where the market data meets the in-place historical financials and understanding, okay, well, if the vacancy is 12%, but we feel confident that the market is running at 6%, that presents an opportunity. Similarly, if rents are averaging $800, but market is running at 1,000, that also presents an opportunity. So, so uncovering those opportunities is uh, a big component of underwriting because it's, it's one thing just to underwrite to just be able to accurately portray what is current what is currently happening right it's not too hard to copy and paste the the historical numbers into your own model and say okay well here's here are the way the numbers look here's a cap rate and that's that it takes a lot more skill to be able to uh, make assumptions about the future and about what you can do in terms of executing your business plan that's perfect thank you so much now are there any particular buy criteria that you typically look for when um, analyzing some of these properties yeah, so we try to stay flexible and open-minded as to from where and whether or not a deal is going to look good. So, you know, we found good deals on market. We found good deals off market. You know, even good deals are on loop net. So you just never know where a good deal is going to come from. So we try to stay open-minded. But our general criteria is we're looking to deliver 14 to 15% net IRR to our investors. And IRR is just a compounded calculation of annualized returns. So, so something like a 15% return for our investors is what we're typically targeting. And what that means is it puts us for the most part in a value add strategy or, or more risky, like opportunistic. So, because for example, I could find the best core opportunity in the world. And for those that aren't familiar, core is a asset class and strategy, which is really to buy the best quality assets in the best quality locations. So a core investment would be, uh, you know, in, in the best location of Austin, Texas, for example, that's growing really well. You've got 100,000 median household incomes and, you know, the assets just a couple years old. That would be a core investment. And so not to go too far off uh, on this tangent, but basically the idea is if I bought the best core opportunity ever, the most return I could possibly see is something like 10% because at the end of the day, I'm not taking much risk. So to hit the returns that we're seeking, we need to actually seek out business plans that allow us to take risk. And what that means is we need to buy properties that are either, you know, older in, you know, developing areas, not as, you know, stable and strong areas, but hopefully growing and, and, you know, class B and C areas. Uh, so older, air, older properties, um, not as great of areas and, uh, an opportunity to improve management, increase revenue, uh, decrease expenses, things like that. How far out do you go as far as miles or travel time outside of a major city into like a tertiary market? So there's definitely a, a distinction that needs to be made between investing in a primary market or even a secondary market uh, and, and a nearby tertiary market. And so while we're comfortable investing in smaller markets that are tertiary, we recognize the risks and we usually, uh, we, we bake in a certain risk premium to be essentially compelled to, to go out there and take that additional risk. So 
basically we, we focus on Houston, for example, and for us to want to go to, let's say Beaumont, which is 90 miles east of Houston, or go down south to Corpus Christi, which are smaller markets that are tertiary to Houston, let's say, uh, you know, if I can get a 15% return in Houston, why would I ever go and get a 15% return in Corpus Christi, right? I need a risk premium. So we're not going to just turn down a property or an opportunity just given its location alone. We, ha- we want to understand, okay, well, if we can get a 17 or an 18% return in Corpus Christi, then is it worth it to take that market risk, right? Whereas if we can only get 15 in Houston, for example. So that's, to answer your question, we're, we're pretty flexible. And I would say the, the biggest thing that constrains tertiary market investing is access to capital. Because as you go to a smaller market, you go to a smaller deal, your pool of capital that's interested in backing you in that opportunity shrinks, right? Especially when you're talking about sophisticated institutional level investors that are, um, you know, they have investment committees and they have specific mandates. It makes it a lot harder for them to invest with you. And so we try to take a good balance of finding the best deals and also finding deals that are, um, actually fundable. And what's interesting is those aren't always the same. It's, you know, the, the best deals are, paradoxically the hardest to raise capital for um which is which is a really interesting thought because just by nature of the way investing works you can only the the best deals are the ones where everyone else is pessimistic about them and therefore the price is so low that it allows you to make an outsized return so by definition the best deals are the hardest to raise capital for so we try to strike an even balance there so that we're not um putting ourselves in very difficult positions awesome awesome great answer and then as far as going back to the internal rate of return, now, are you basing it off of a five-year pro forma, 10-year pro forma? How do you come up to that number of 14, 15% IRR? That's a great question. So, and that absolutely is very important to your IRR, right? So the, we, we have two hold periods that we typically underwrite to, three years and five years. And our hold period is dictated by our business plan. So, and the, the easiest way uh, which bucket this a deal should be placed in, whether it should be a three-year deal or a five-year deal, is whether or not we're financing it with a bridge loan or permanent debt. So, if you look at a if you look at a deal that we're doing with a bridge loan, that means it's a transitional asset. It doesn't qualify for traditional or permanent financing. And typically, bridge loans have loan terms of 36 months, and that's why we underwrite to a three-year hold. Also, just given the fact that uh, a bridge loan is typically a situation where you're looking to buy it, fix it, sell it, um, or you might refi, but that's why we do it on a three-year period. Whereas on the, on a five-year hold, that's when we're buying something that's a little more of a stabilized asset. It qualifies for permanent debt. It's it's lower risk, less execution risk, and so five years is the timeline that we choose. And just to add another comment about that, I think consistency is really important. So you should pick a timeline that works for you. And and we've chosen those two, which work for us. And that way you're always comparing apples to apples. Because if you look at one deal and you say, oh, I'm going to underwrite this on a six-year hold, this one on an eight-year hold, this one on a four, it gets harder to compare. And so I think that's important as you underwrite, getting into a groove and um, trying to stay consistent. Wow, I like that. I like that word. You <laughs> you don't throw in too many variables, so nobody's constantly guessing. I like that a lot. So when you're looking at certain markets, just for the audience, are you looking for a 10 to 20 door, a 100 to 200 door? What's kind of your sweet spot for number of doors? Yeah, well, the sweet spot, I would say, is going to be somewhere between 200 and 300. And uh, just because 100 to even 170 can be somewhat of an awkward size in terms of staffing and uh, having economies of scale. And then, you know, no problem with 200 units, no problem with 300 units, but then slightly larger, you know, you can, you can run into issues with 400 and 500 unit properties um, in terms of a culture, how they're, how they're run, how they're managed and, and things like that. So that would be the sweet spot, but our minimums is we're, t- we're typically looking for 150 units uh, plus. And if it's 
However, if it's in a market, if the property is in a market that we already own in, uh, and it's an, sort of an add-on acquisition that's easy to integrate into our management and, and would actually provide some scale, you know, then we're willing to look at 100 units, for example, uh, in that scenario. Perfect. Now, when you're holding it, uh, when you're starting to do the value add, uh, what kind of budgets are you running as far as like the CapEx and anything like that? So, again, this goes back to the type of business plans that we seek out, right? We're seeking to uh, find situations where we can spend rehab dollars to, to fix up units, to command rent premiums, um, potentially to cure deferred maintenance so that we can create a more of a stabilized asset when we go to sell or refi. Uh, so we're typically seeking business plans that necessitate, uh, I'd say, you know, anywhere from four to $12,000 per unit in CapEx. And uh, if you're not so familiar, that may sound like a lot, that may sound like a little bit, um, but generally speaking, to do a, a typical unit renovation it costs around $5,000 in our markets. So your budget could be completely eaten up just with interior renovations. You could also have you know, uh, roof repairs or parking lots. Uh, you could have foundations. So those types of things on the exterior and the deferred maintenance can also eat into your budget a lot as well there. So, um, so with those two combined, you know, I'd say anywhere from uh, four to 12,000 is, is what we're looking for. Got it. And then as far as reserves, when you're typically acquiring, what kind of built in number are you throwing in? Is it a one year reserve, six month reserve? What kind of reserves are you looking for or building in into your formula? Yeah, sure. So I, I love the topic of reserves. Um, and I'll, I'll broaden it to all of the reserves associated with the deal, right? So we'll start with operating reserves or operating capital, right? And again, we bifurcate by whether the deal is a bridge loan deal, which is more of a transitional buy it, fix it, sell it strategy, or is it a permanent deal where it's more of a cash flow strategy? So if, if the property is stabilized, meaning it qualifies for permanent debt, we plan on holding it, cash flows day one, we're only going to hold in reserves for operating capital one month of operating expenses plus debt service. And if it's a bridge loan, we just double that. We do two months of operating, um, operating expenses and debt service. And that can come out to be on a $10 million deal. That typically is somewhere between $100,000 to $250,000, right? Again, if it's one or two months and, you know, certain variables there. So, uh, so that's, that's the first reserve, which is operating capital. Then another reserve, we were just talking about CapEx, we always have a contingency, right? Because everybody knows construction projects always uh, go over budget and they, you know, go over time wise. So we're typically uh, reserving up a 5% uh, contingency in our CapEx budget. So if we have a million dollar CapEx budget, we'll have $50,000 just as a contingency. Now, another reserve is our replacement reserves. And so replacement reserves are actually lender mandated reserves that you escrow to the lender on a monthly basis so that the lender has confidence that you actually have enough capital to take care of ongoing capital needs and they actually, you know, hold the funds. And so you go to them and you say, Hey, I completed this project. Can I get reimbursed for it? Thank you very much. And you know, that's something that we factor into our pro forma and even more importantly, we factor it in above the line. So we include it into our NOI calculation, which some people choose to put it uh, below the line and not factor it into their, into their NOI, but we, we incorporate it into the NOI, which obviously reduces our cap rate. And um, you know, when we go to sell the property on, an, uh, on our underwriting, it shows a slightly lower purchase price or a slightly lower sales price because we are selling at a lower NOI given those reserves. So, so those are some of the reserves that go into a deal. Wow, Rob, you're getting into a lot of technical verbiage, and I love it. <laughs> you know, ladies and gentlemen, that's why you need to buy his book, because he's getting into all these different terminology that I probably lost half the audience, I'm not sure. But guys, above the line, below the line, IRR, all those terms are very, very important when you're underwriting um, deals. And he also mentioned multiple things on reserves. There's not just one reserve. So awesome, awesome points, Rob. 
Okay, so let's talk about when you're talking to investors and you're throwing out your private placement memorandum, are you, as an operator, throwing in uh, a management fee, acquisition fee, uh, property management fee for managing the asset? Or is that built into your PPM? Yeah, so I can quickly run through. Everybody has their own structure, and obviously, as an investor, you want to spend a lot of time focusing on the structure that's outlined in the PPM and also having a conversation with the sponsor about it because uh, compensation structures are more than just how much is the sponsor taking away from my cut, right? Or how much of, the, of a cut do they get? It's also an alignment of interest and can provide insight into kind of the bigger picture and the, maybe the, the inside the mind of the sponsor to understand what, what motivates them. So uh, to run through just our structure, which is very typical, uh, we have an upfront acquisition fee that's paid at closing, which is anywhere from one to 2% of the purchase price. We have an ongoing asset management fee that is typically paid out quarterly based on revenue. And then upon sale, there's a promote or a carried interest, which is a performance compensation, um, typically paid above and beyond a preferred return hurdle. So investors are owed a minimum IRR of let's say 8%. And then above that 8%, once they've received that 8% IRR, you know, the sponsor, which is us, will be taking, let's say 20 to 30% of the residual profits um, there. So that's a very typical structure. And I just want to outline, you know, uh, as an investor, you want to understand, okay, how much do they anticipate making from the promote? How much do they anticipate making from you know, the acquisition fee, the asset management fee, and kind of understand if that makes sense, if it's market. And then the big one is hidden fees. Uh, there, there's numerous ways that you can bake in additional compensation for the sponsor. And I think it's uh, pretty important for investors to be aware of those. And I definitely go in more detail in my underwriting book about, uh, about those. Perfect. Perfect. Now, last part is disposition. So I'm not sure, but is anybody on the team a realtor first off? Not in Texas. Okay. So when you built in your disposition fee in your private placement memorandum, uh, how much do you typically throw in there? So we don't actually charge a disposition fee, uh, but it's very common for I wouldn't say very common, but it's common for sponsors to have a 1% disposition fee based on the sales price. Okay, perfect. And now you said you built it off your, your business plan, typically three to five years of all the projects. Have you ever gotten it out early or later and why? So we actually haven't sold anything yet. We have, we have entered into deals with bridge loans, right? Which are, typically a shorter term process. Um, but we've uh, refinanced out of the bridge loan into permanent debt, which then kind of turns it into two deals. You had the upfront deal, which was the bridge loan, the buy it, fix it, sell it scenario, raise the value of the property, low cash flow because you're in a transitional process. But then once the business plan is complete, again, you can sell and monetize all the value you've created, or you can monetize the value through a refi. You can see some return of capital, uh, a lower interest rate because now you have permanent debt instead of bridge. And then now you're in a new deal, which is, you know, stabilized, low risk and, and very nice cash flow. Got it. Got it. What's the largest acquisition you've had year to date? It was about a 15 and a half million dollar purchase with a $2 million CapEx budget. Nice. How many doors and where? 261 in Houston. Wow. That's pretty massive. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. So um, what are you focusing on right now? What are you kind of working on right now, Rob? Yeah. So something that's been a big focus for us at Lone Star Capital is preferred equity. And I'll explain what preferred equity is, but also I just want to mention that it's, it's in response to, it's been something that's on our mind for almost a year now that we were contemplating um, going into, but once COVID hit and there were uh, these new market fundamentals occurring in the capital markets, such as senior lenders pulling back on loan proceeds, uh, agency lenders requiring uh, debt service reserves or, you know, called COVID reserves. Um, 
you know, we, we saw these things happening in the market. And in response, we really felt compelled that we needed to launch this preferred equity platform. And so to explain what preferred equity is, preferred equity is a form of subordinate financing that is that goes on top of the senior loan, depending on how you look at a capital stack. The way we look at it is we start from the foundation as the, the floor at the bottom, and we build up our capital structure from there. So the senior lender is first in the most, in the most lower position in the capital structure. Then our preferred equity is layered on top as quasi debt. It's equity, so it's in making an investment into the partnership, but it has certain rights and controls um, that make it look a little more like debt. So what we're seeking when we make a preferred equity investment is we're seeking a fixed rate of return and giving the sponsor or the common equity that sits subordinate to us all the upside. So if they hit a home run, we're going to get our fixed rate of return there, which is we're very happy about. We're, you know, we're grateful for, and then all the upside is for the sponsor. So it's preferred equity is this, you know, in between debt and equity, um, form of, of financing. And for us, we re recognize the fact that senior lenders were previously lending at, let's say, 80% of loan to value. Now they're lending at maybe 75 or even 70. So they've pulled back and that's created a gap. And then similarly, equity investors who are backing sponsors on their deals, you know, starting back in March, they got very skittish, very uncertain about what was happening in the world. And so they went pencils down and didn't want to fund new projects or just became very selective. And that also, you know, exacerbated the, the lack of access to capital for sponsors. And so preferred equity is a great solution there where we can come in. If, if a senior lender is only coming in at 75%, we can take the leverage up to 85% via our preferred equity and leaving the sponsor only needing to fund 15% of the project's costs. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's what we've been working on. Happy to, to share more information about that or, or you know, why we think it's a, a, a valuable strategy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So as far as you, you're still going to be considered the operator? No. So, and, it, and it, can be, it can be in certain scenarios, but for the most part, what we're looking to do is partner with local sponsors and we're not going to be the day-to-day -day operator. We will have major control rights as the preferred equity, right? Just, kind of, just as a senior lender has, you know, reporting requirements and covenants, you know, we'll, we have similar covenants uh, there as well, but we are not the day-to-day -day manager of the asset. Um, if, if there is non-performance, you know, we have the ability to step in and take over, but that's absolutely not what we're looking to do because obviously that's a headache and it's a lot more work to actually manage an asset day-to-day -day than simply, you know, make an investment with a sponsor. Got it. So you're going to be kind of like in second position on the note? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, similar to being in second position, except we actually don't hold any uh, pledge or lien as collateral. So our collateral is through our uh, outlined through the operating agreement or the joint venture agreement, um, you know, of the borrowing op uh, of the borrowing single purpose entity. Got it. Got it. What's the big reason why this move in the market right now? Yeah. So basically, you know, I outlined kind of the current market, fundamentals and how lenders have pulled back and there's this gap. And, you know, at the same time, sponsors are very eager to get deals done and, uh, you know, they're willing to take on this form of financing. Um, for us as, as a buyer, we own property. We, we acquire for, our, you know, for our investors and ourselves, you know, we underwrite deals every day and we see, uh, we see a lot of people overpaying and, and returns being very slim. And when we see returns, let's just say at 12%, right? And I told you earlier, it's about 15% that makes us get excited and say, we want this one, right? So if the returns are 12%, you know, that's not worth it for us to take the risk, to do all the work, to try to generate that return. However, instead, if we can provide preferred equity and earn that same 12%, let's say, you know, that's, that sounds very compelling to us because now we're earning the same return uh, but we're taking less risk because we're sitting in a more senior position in the capital structure with equity cushion subordinate to us, providing us with a lot of downside protection. And we don't have to actually spend all this effort with, you know, day-to-day -day management responsibilities. So those two things make it highly compelling to actually take a defensive strategy, take, accept a lower but fixed rate of return 
uh, with downside protection over, uh, you know, trying to take more risk and, uh, you know, seek higher returns where they may or may not be available. Perfect. Now, are you lending uh, this opportunity for other operators outside of the states that you invest in? Yeah, that's a great question. So before we hit record, you're asking me, you know, where do we invest? Uh, you know, and we're very focused on Texas, as you know. Uh, but with preferred equity, since we aren't the day to day uh, manager, you know, we are looking at, um, you know, more markets and we're comfortable going to, you know, newer markets for us. For example, we're currently looking at uh, a deal in Georgia, a deal in, um, Pennsylvania and a deal in Illinois. So right now we have, you know, a lot more geographic diversification in the strategy. Wow. That's great. And any particular reason why those states? No, just, that's just happened to be where the, where the deals are coming from uh, in the last week. Nice. Nice. You as an investor, do you have any preference right now? You personally, Rob, like, Hey, I like, the Midwest, I like East Coast, I like the West Coast. Any particular places you favor? So personally, I like, um, I still love Texas. I think Texas is, it's so far has been doing very well during this uh, new interesting period of time we're in. Um, I, think, I think Texas will continue to perform very well. I'm hoping that Las Vegas emerges as a new opportunity for us. Um, you know, obviously everybody knows that Las Vegas is highly concentrated in hospitality and hospitality has been hit hard, understandably so by the COVID pandemic. And so uh, it would be interesting to see if that market ends up having some people that get uh, shaken out of some deals or some, some people, some sellers being forced to sell at favorable prices. Uh, you know, we would welcome the opportunity to in effect catch a falling knife and buy into Las Vegas in a time of weakness if such a thing occurs, which so far, you know, Vegas, like most markets have been fairly resilient. Um, but that would be, I think, an exciting opportunity. Perfect. Now, you mentioned you were from the Bay Area. I'm not sure if your parents are still out there. Are there any reasons uh, why or why not uh, California or Bay Area? Yeah, I, you know, investing in California is... Uh, very interesting proposition because you have very low cap rates, you have uh, regulation and uncertain uncertainties about the future regulations that have yet to come and that may or may not come. Uh, so I think for just those reasons alone, it's, it's very difficult to invest. Um, but, you know, some other reasons are because of those low cap rates, it's harder to get um, full leverage. So, you know, with a, a deal that you're buying at a five cap, which, you know, is not a great cap rate, but it's acceptable, you can actually, because of the cost of financing today, you can actually get full leverage. So if the lender is willing to lend up to 75 or 80% of value, assuming that it passes the income requirements as well, uh, you know, getting full leverage is a wonderful thing, especially from a tax perspective. So because if I can get depreciation on the asset, and only have to put 20% down, my 20% down gets all the depreciation. Whereas if I have to put 40% down in California, let's say, that same amount of depreciation is spread over twice as many dollars, right? Which is reducing the tax benefit impact of the investment. So that's just another interesting reason why, uh, you know, not California. Got it. Thank you. All right, Rob. Well, it's been a pleasure. Any last tips, anything you're promoting, ways to get a hold of you for our audience? Well, you, you graciously recommended my book earlier, so I do appreciate that. I highly recommend everybody jump on Amazon and uh, check out the Definitive Guide to Underwriting Multifamily Acquisitions. Uh, also, I am not finished, but in the process of releasing um, a, a white paper called the Preferred Equity Manifesto, which I did an okay job of explaining preferred equity on this show today, but I promise I do a much better job uh, explaining it because it is a complex um, product or you know, strategy in the Preferred Equity Manifesto. So um, you know, when, it's, when it's live, I will, I will you know, I'll let you know. Hopefully you can put it in the show notes so people can uh, check out the free download link for the white paper. Perfect. 
And best way to get a hold of you? So to learn more about us, Lone Star Capital, you can visit lonestarcapgroup.com. There you can join our email list. You can download my personal underwriting model that we use every day to analyze deals. Yeah. Um, To analyze deals, the definitive guide to underwriting multifamily acquisitions. Check it on, on Amazon. Reach out to Rob. Very, very great to have you on the show, Rob. Thank you so much. Our company is not responsible for the success or failure of your business decisions relating to any information presented by our company or our company programs, products, and or services. 